All right, let's get going. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you all for tuning in from around the globe today. Uh, thank you for taking your time to uh, join me on a tour of Azure Functions. Over the next 45 minutes, my goal is to share some insights on the microservice architecture pattern and how we can leverage Azure Functions to quickly hit the ground running and implement microservices. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Vincent Bortone, and I like to think of myself as a part-time musician full-time technologist. Uh, now I have to tell you, both these roles uh, will play a part in today's presentation. Okay. Um, so we'll start with the technical, uh, the technologist side of things. Uh, I am a techno uh, technical manager here at Cognizant Soft Vision. I've been with the uh, company for a little bit over two years now, um, based out of the West Palm Beach studio. Um, I manage teams and architect projects for one of our uh, professional services clients. Um, before joining Cognizant Soft Vision, I spent the majority of my career in the legal industry, building uh, corporate legal solutions uh, for one of the U.S.'s top M&A firms in New York City. Um, and and uh, if my accent hasn't given away, um, you can tell I'm, I'm from the Northeast. Um, and now, um, as I mentioned, as far as the full-time musician, uh, we'll get back to him a little later. Uh, so let's start with the agenda for today. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, first the, the five W's of microservices. Um, and from there, we'll move on to the introduction to Azure Functions. And then finally, uh, we'll uh, take a quick spin around Azure Functions and uh, with the hands-on demo, and uh, then we'll go from there. So the first thing I want people to think of when you think of microservices, I'm mean, sort of a simple statement, microservices equals choice. And the choice uh, is, uh, the, the choice of technologies, of programming languages, of database languages, keep this in the back of your mind as we sort of explore uh, why you might want to uh, dive into using microservices if you haven't already. Um, so let's start with the five W's. Uh, so those of you not familiar with that term, just to quickly, that's uh, the five W's are sort of the what, why, when, where, and who is sort of a, a way to sort of uh, quickly in, uh, investigate a particular topic or subject and sort of break them down. Um, so we're going to start with uh, the what and the why of microservices. So when we think of microservices, uh, the first thought that comes to mind is uh, independent components running uh, remotely, like uh, with methods that are uh, invoked across the boundaries of the caller's process. Right? Um, and while this is a, uh, a major part of microservices, what I've just described is also uh, uh, WCF. Right? It's it's at ASP Web Services, uh, RMI, uh, Corba, DCOM, we go back 20 years. Um, so for the longest time, our industry has been working on remote invocation of components. You see the core design of microservices is not that novel or unique, but as with all technology patterns and practices, it often takes multiple iterations to improve patterns. So let's focus on some of the other attributes that make up microservice architectural pattern and highlight some of its strengths. Componentization via services, right? So this, so this sort of plays into sort of the remote invocation. Um, so this, the concept around here is that microservices uh, can be independently executed. Um, they may run in one or more processes of their own, um, but mainly they can be provisioned, swapped in, and, and, and utilized without uh, the uh, effect or compilation of other uh, of uh, of other components of the application, um, you know, sort of a complement of this would be uh, a componentization via libraries, right? So this is what we're used to today. Um, anyone who's ever done any .NET development or new uh, use NuGet or uh, npm and is uh, under node, um, that's sort of, you know, integrating components uh, into a core application, whereas uh, with services, what we're looking for is, the, is that independence. Um, now that independence has some downsides, of course, uh, but uh, we'll get to that a little later. So um, next slide here. So a focus on products, right? So also, so one of the core tenets of microservices is the idea that we, um, sort of support the life cycle of a product from its end. You know, I, I believe it's at, at Amazon, the mantra is sort of like, you build it, you run it, you support it, right? So you, um, you sort of support and, and manage that 
product through its entire life cycle. So it's not just a simply a sort of deploy and 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 let go, right? So the and uh, you know the big uh, sort of aspect of that is the uh, of course uh, the DevOps initiatives, right? So DevOps um, sort of bridging the world of developers and operations, and uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. Um, let me move on to the next component. Uh, so smart components and simple connections, right? So um, one of the, another core tenant of microservices um, is that we have, that the services themselves are smart, but the, the, the technologies that connect them are, are, are simple, right? So they are, you know, one of the, uh, probably, so, you know, if we all remember a couple of years back uh, and using uh, service-oriented architecture and web services, um, there was a lot of infrastructure that was built around that, you know, enterprise service buses, uh, complicated middleware products, right? So, and, you know, a lot of people believe that is essentially with some of the downfall of some of those uh, SOA technologies was sort of that complexity that, uh, that they entail, right? With microservices, you know, we usually rely on simple endpoints, simple message queues, things like uh, Azure Service Bus or RabbitMQ, um, or even j just basic straight REST HTTP calls. So an another tenet is, is around the continuous integration and continuous delivery, right? The DevOps. Now, obviously this is not uh, only uh, to microservices, but uh, you know, this also works in many different types of architectural patterns, but um, you know, in most any modern development today, uh, continuous integration is a key is a key component, uh, and uh, that uh, ability to sort of uh, agile in an agile manner update your uh, update your project and keep it up to date independently of other solutions um, is a key factor. Um, probably one of the more uh, sort of interesting pattern uh, tenets here is the uh, sort of the polyglot programming. Um, the, sort of the the belief here is that a microservice, you know, for your microservice, you use the best technology available for that particular task, right? So, um, recently worked on a project for the client where we investigated using a, a Python uh, Azure function, you know, um, because uh, Python has a, a very simple way of dynamically loading. Uh, modules into the system uh, and and in order to build this sort of dynamic runtime uh, as, as a, a technique that was much easier to do in Python and it wasn't too sharp uh, um, and uh, so you could do that with this you know and that, and sort of you think of it as uh, the same with persistence right so you may have particular uh, microservices that uh, that would work better with a NoSQL server solution, right? Where your database um, versus a maybe traditional SQL server, right? Um, so uh, again, sort of that advantage of sort of being able to leverage technology um, that's best fit for the particular role for the particular task. Um, so, you know, the last tenant here I want to refer to is, is sort of components organized around business capabilities, right? And so this is, uh, this is sort of a big one, right? So in traditional uh, architectures, often applications are divided by a sort of a, a technology hierarchy where it's a database, middle tier, front tier, right? Um, the concept of, of organizing your code around business capabilities is to sort of take a sort of business approach and organizing entire development teams around sort of a particular business task now. Those familiar with uh, domain-driven design often, you know, this is sort of really falls into uh, very nicely into the idea of a bound context. Um, but what you'll see even more, and as we talk about, you know, business teams and cross-cutting business teams that are that are that are functional for my colleagues here at Cognitive Soft Vision, it should really ring true that what we're talking about is the pot, right? So. So as you can see here, microservices is a uh, is a great uh, architecture um, to support our you know our pod you know, structure, our, you know sort of a, the core DNA, uh, uh, you know sort of how we envision and how we're moving forward in the future, right? So um, so so it's exciting, right? It's exciting. Exciting is a great architectural opportunity. Um, so let's move on to the when. So like when to use microservices. 
So now before we go into uh, when and when not, I need to address another sort of M term, uh, which is very popular in sort of comparison to microservices. So I'm actually just gonna see if anyone wants to throw in the chat what they think I'm about to talk about. So I'll just give it a second here. To... All right, so I'm not getting anything through. So, so what I'm referring to is monolith, right? So, so you know, it's often most the first thing you'll do when you read about uh, microservices is sort of you'll get a comparison of, you know, microservices versus monolith. Why monoliths are outdated or bad? Um, and I'm not really going to get into a deep philosophical debate about uh, which pattern is better. Uh, monoliths are not evil and um and let's be honest right you know when when determining which is the better solution to uh pr to introduce to the client you know we have to go and initially give the the response that most of us are used to in the in the it world and that is it depends it depends on on your needs right so now if your application depends on one or more of these microservice qualities that we just previously discussed then by all means you know microservices is a great fit However, if, you know, if you're coming in with a simple application or a small team, you know, a monolithic application still might be your best choice. Um, you know, monolithic applications are A, easier to debug. Uh, B, they're easier to deploy. Um, you could argue that they're, they're easier to develop. And then finally, they're definitely easier to test. And you know, as if you remember the sort of the old acronym of KISS, right, keep it, or we'll say keep it super simple. Um, you know, sometimes there's, there's something to be said about just starting with a file new, um, and sort of. So while that, you know, while microservice offers a great amount of flexibility and control, and we're going to go more into that, um, by no means is it the only solution. Right. So, so on that front, we'll, we'll sort of wrap up and sort of talk about the who, where, and how. And so the who, where, and how is, uh, the who is us, of course, and the where is here. And how, and how is Azure Functions, right? So let's talk a bit about Azure Functions. And, and so if we think about Azure Functions or more generically serverless functions or known as functions as a service, you can kind of see they're the next incarnation sort of, of, a, of a trend of, of how we move through uh, hosting services in, over the last couple of years, right? So, you know, we sort of start with sort of the bring your own server, the traditional on-site model. Um, and we sort of move over to uh, infrastructure as a service, uh, you know, hosting VMs in the cloud. Over time, those services have been abstracted out further. So uh, think of Azure Web Services, um, other, other platform options, and now functions as a service, right? And, and so what is functions as a service, right? So essentially serverless computing is a model, right? Where the cloud provider, like Azure, dynamically allocates c compute resources to execute your code, right? So you're no longer worrying about provisioning any sort of server, any sort of service. It's just a matter of writing the code, pushing it to the cloud, defining different endpoints, and, and sort of executing the code. So from a developer's perspective, it is a, it is a great way to sort of get moving, right? And so as we talk about uh, some of the features of Azure uh, Functions in particular, um, what we'll see here is that some, a lot of these features really line up well with some of the microservice tenants that uh, we just previously discussed. So first, of course, uh, we have the, the choice of language. Uh, today, with the latest version of Azure Functions, Azure uh, supports, uh, of course, C-sharp, uh, Java, JavaScript, uh, Python, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and even PowerShell, which I think, uh, I don't know anyone who'd want to write code in PowerShell if they didn't 
have to really have to, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it is an option. And uh, as, as this maps to sort of our uh, polyglot programming model that I discussed earlier, right? Being able to sort of, again, pick the best tool for the job. Um, you know, Azure Functions uh, supports package management support. We, uh, so Python so supports PIP and, and JavaScript and Node supports NPM and C-sharp of course uh, supports NuGet. So, so by default, you get access to an incredible amount, a vast amount of libraries that you can include in your functions. Um, a big thing is the flexible pricing. Uh, the pricing is uh, initially, most people would start with a sort of a consumption model. So the consumption model is a pay per use, essentially pay per click. Um, um, and then ideally then from there, um, you know, at some point, you know, based on the popularity of your service, a more traditional app service plan um, might make more sense. And there are plenty of calculators and um, for you to, to sort of determine when that sort of breaking point is. Um, you know, if we continue down the list, uh, integrated security um, is another key feature of Azure Functions, right? So out of the box, there's support for, uh, OAuth, Azure Active Directory, um, many of the third-party authorization tools, Facebook, Google, Twitter, uh, and of course, Microsoft accounts. Um, simplified integration to other Azure offerings. So this is something we're gonna dive into in more detail in, a little, um, in the next section. Uh, but uh, the way the Azure functions are constructed, um, they provide a very declarative way to sort of to work with other Azure tooling. So um, think uh, Azure Service Bus, Cosmos DB, uh, table storage, blob storage, queues. Um, this really kind of again falls into um, both sort of that polyglot persistence, which we talked about earlier, as well as sort of working with simplified links you know, and sort of how we invoke these uh, Azure functions and, and sort of how they out, their results are output onto other potential functions or other uh, outputs um, and flexible deployment. So one of the advantages of, I guess the final advantage here is that um, it has full support under Azure DevOps. Um, Azure functions can be provisioned using ARM templates. Uh, they can be scripted using uh, the Azure CLI and batch scripts and they can be built in and can, they can be configured by Azure configuration services and uh, of course deployed uh, as part of the uh, so build and deploy releases of Azure DevOps. Uh, so they really um, can easily be included in your sort of in your enterprise uh, project scheme. So let's move on to the anatomy of an Azure function. All right, so uh, an Azure function, if we look here, it sort of has three sort of exterior components to the actual logic. So if you think of your, your code, your logic sits inside the function app in the middle here. Um, and so the, the function needs some sort of trigger to call it off. And so um, there are, this is just a small subset of the uh, triggers and inputs that are available for uh, Azure Functions. Um, so in, in, in often uh, a service bus message or a queue message, um, sometimes it's a timer. Um, and then based on the, those inputs, uh, there's some great change tracking features in, in Cosmos DB to be able to sort of track the change uh, of a document object uh, or some other query um, to essentially kick off the, uh, the function. Uh, when that uh, trigger is kicked off, it may or may not contain data in that trigger. If not, we can also declare um, a multitude of inputs. Again, the sort of blob storage um, as with Cosmos DB. Um, and then that finally the outputs, right? So we have, uh, again, the very similar storage models. There's also the traditional HTTP, you know, sort of returning back um, you know, from a post with the, you know, with the, with the body uh, of your results or your process results to further process another application. So, um, so as we get ready for the demo here now, so, so I talked earlier about uh, playing music, right? So, you know, you know, most of the time, you know, most of my work is in, is sort of in the, uh, some financial services and, and, and professional services. I didn't want to go down that route today. I thought uh, we'd try something a little different, right? So um, 
actually going to go into the chat again, ask for the chat again and see, uh, do we have any other musicians in the group today? Um, if you do, if you could just say yes, or just even throw what instrument you you play. Um, and if not, uh, what kind of music do you like? Do you, uh, if you're like me, you're a, sort of a, a rock fan. Aha, uh -huh. Alex, nice. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, as, a, I, as you saw, I play bass as well. Um, cool, DJ, nice. Um, hip hop, okay, great. Um, so today I'm gonna, I'm sort of gonna speak from the rock musician standpoint, but uh, you know, this hopefully will, will, will translate to other genres as too. So um, as you can see, right, so, um, so as a musician, right, so as a bass player in my case, and right, so you know, I play, or did play before a pandemic uh, in a cover band um, that covered classic rock songs, right? And so we cover a, a wide range of different artists. And so if I wanted to, excuse me, my slide deck stopped. There we go. So let's say I wanted to play. So here is James Jameson is a, James is a, is a classic Motown, many considered to be the best bass player, um, electric bass player ever to live, right? And he played on pretty much most of the Motown tracks of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, or, you know, maybe something a little more modern, a little more funky, right? We have Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, right? You know, so, um, so one of the big things that, that, and most people who are starting music can, can attest to is that, um, you know, trying to replicate the sound of a particular artist or a particular song is very, can be very challenging, right? So, you know, so I sit here, you know, I spend many hours sort of tweaking and, you know, searching the internet for uh, forums. And unfortunately, music forums don't have the same search capability as let's say Stack Overflow, uh, where we can go and find our, uh, you know, where we all end up, find, you know, looking for lots of code. You know, it's hard to necessarily to find the tone um, or how to tune in your instruments to get the tone. And the truth of the matter is, is that it's more than just the instrument, right? So with, with rock music or a lot of music, I mean, there's a lot of elements that are involved in, in sort of making tone, getting a particular tone out. You know, there's the amplifiers and the, the strings and the and uh, just the microphones used to record the amplifiers. It's, there's, there's just a lot of different elements, right? So, but I'm, so now with my, back to my full technologist role, to sort of change hats here, you know, I'm sort of thinking, like, wouldn't it be great if I could just have an application that I just typed in the name of a song and it came back with, you know, however curated, you know, a list of the equipment and the art, you know, and, uh, types of types of guitars types of amps you know as much detail as possible to, to sort of be able to replicate or figure out how to replicate that sound right so so today as part of our demo now we're gonna work on a concept called the tone library so uh so right so we're gonna use we're gonna sort of demo a little bit how to do how to build azure functions from scratch um so I'm gonna start off today with just sort of the quick hello world, and then I'm gonna jump over to uh, a service that I already started. And hopefully if we have a little time at the end, I may have an extra little bonus feature I haven't really talked about to, to cover. So, um, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna switch screens now here. So you should all see Visual Studio here. Let me just bring up the fresh window, okay. And all right, so today I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. Of course, you can use Visual Studio uh, um, Community or Professional 2017 or 2019. Um, why I like code is mainly because I know there's a lot of us here, who are, you know, using other operating systems, whether they're using Linux or Mac OS, right? And so this is sort of sort of will provide a solution that would be uh, consistent amongst the sort of all the operating systems. Um, so if you, I imagine a lot of you are already familiar with, uh, with uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, definitely some, uh, some recommendations that get started with Azure Functions. Uh, there is the uh, sort of Azure Function Toolkit. Um, there's actually a whole suite of these toolkits uh, that essentially will install an Azure 
uh, component on the sidebar of your Visual Studio Code. Um, from there, you would essentially you would sign into your to an Azure account, as you can see here. I have access to a couple of accounts here, and it gives you a great uh, access within Visual Studio Code without requiring you to run off to back and forth between the portal. We will visit the portal a little later, uh, but for now, I want to sort of show how you could quickly get get started. Uh, building Azure Functions today from your machine. I also should mention, um, as part of this, there's another component to install um, called Azure Function Core Tools. Now, Azure Core Function Core Tools will um, allow you to develop and debug Azure Functions locally on your machine. Um, works best if you have sort of the Azure storage emulator, right, so that helps you. Um, but what you'll see, um, and what you can do is actually is you can even install some uh, there's an Azure Cosmos DB emulator. So you can really, and a lot of the big question is I don't have access to Azure. How do I get started? Truth is you can do a lot locally and you can use that um, local capabilities really to sort of like come up to speed with uh, a lot of the uh, sort of initial how-tos, right? So of course it doesn't fully replicate the full cloud experience, but um, definitely a great starting point, something you can do of no charge um, and get going. So uh, on that point, so as you can see here, we, we have a section here called the uh, you know, function section. Um, as you'll see up here, we, we're gonna create a new project, new Azure function project. And so this will start prompting me. We'll start with a, I'm just gonna call this. Good old classic hello world. Okay, and we're gonna pick our language of choice. So I'm gonna go with C sharp. It's the end of the day. It's still my primary language. All right, so the next step is the trigger. So as I showed in the diagram earlier, um, we have a, a sort of a handful of triggers that we could use to uh, um, but the easiest one to get started with is the HTTP trigger, right? As you can see, I've been using it recently. So we will start there. And I'm just gonna get, I'm just gonna call this method, hello world. I know. And hit enter. Um, here you would, you could enter a namespace for your codes. I'm just gonna call it uh, you know, Programmers Week 2020. And then we could uh, pick the security, right? So I'm not going to go uh, heavily into depth on the different uh, security models, but essentially function is um, essentially requires a key to be passed through the header. Um, anonymous is just open wide and uh, admin is, is sort of like a, uh, a, a different set of keys. So uh, I'm just going to stick with function for now. Uh, and then we're going to open it in the current window. All right. So here we do. We now ha we have a uh, C sharp project um, that uh, using an Azure Function template. So we took a quick gander at uh, so what's involved here. So um, it's, it's a very simple sort of project structure, right? So we have this concept of a settings file, a local settings file. Um, this file is where you would come in and store additional values, connection strings, uh, things of that nature. Um, and uh, we'll sort of get to that a little bit later. Um, but we have, uh, so we have our hello world method, right? Uh, so this is the core, this was the guts of the function here. And uh, my Visual Studio is, is angry because I have to build the project. So let me just go ahead and do that. So interestingly enough that the, uh, C sharp um, methods, uh, the C sharp version of Azure Functions um, leverages attributes uh, for a lot of the metadata, sort of binding the triggers, the uh, inputs and outputs. Um, what you'll see if you, you choose to try with other languages is that pretty much every other language will sort of extract out this metadata to a, uh, to a separate file, to a separate JSON file. Um, and after a while, I think sometimes I look at this and I, I think that's, that 
honestly is probably the better way, you know, I would be surprised if the C-sharp methods eventually go that route as well. Um, uh, reading a, a method with lots of attributes um, can, get, uh, can get tough. So, um, so now we've built the solution. And uh, so this is a very basic, this is like, again, the hello world of Azure Functions. But uh, what we can do now is we can actually run and debug them locally. So now we provision, we hit F5. As you see below, I'm building the solution. Okay. All right. So, so you see now here. So now we're uh, so it's, it's running Kestrel local uh, local web server um, on port seventy seventy one. Um, and now we can access this method. So I am actually going to just take this method and open it up in the browser. Oh, wrong button. Okay, right. So, so here, as you can see, we have in Chrome, we have, I'm just gonna put in, it's asking for an attribute. So I'm just go ahead and put my name in, right? And so as you can see, we're processing. So now we have Azure Function Endpoint running locally on your machine completely. You know, this has not been published into the cloud yet. You can uh, you can use breakpoints and, and debug um, as you would expect in sort of any Visual Studio um, experience. Um, so this is sort of the, the simple solution. Um, and before we jump to sort of a, a one that's already sort of in progress, uh, let me just show you the, 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 how you essentially deploy this. So we're going to stop this here and we're going to move to back to this Azure sc screen and we are going to Oh, let's hope the demo gods will <laughs> behave. Uh, So when Visual Studio is not crashing, um, we even see the list of functions here. Um, so let me just, we might just have to jump to the next demo. Let's see. Uh, yeah, all right, let's close that. Okay. All right, so yeah, so that uh, not go as planned, but okay, we'll just move it, we'll move on. So, um, so essentially after um, just to sort of to verbally walk through, um, you know, what you do when you come in and expand the functions window, you'll actually see your local project, the one you have open uh, in this alongside your, uh, any connections to, to Azure functions. And from here you would come in and just, you know, click a single button and deploy. Um, and so um, again, as far as like an entry uh, route to sort of get your, feet wet uh, is a great method. So um, so now let's shift focus a little bit, right? So we sort of move back to the sort of our concept we were talking about earlier about music, right? And and so what you're seeing in front of us now is a uh, is the amplifier sort of microservice, right? So we're talking about different elements of music and being at, so now let's say we've got some funding, we our teams are getting off the ground. And so we've decided to use a microservice architecture um, and we're gonna concentrate, have different teams concentrate on different tone components of the uh, of the back end here. So um, so today we have ample, uh, the amplifier microservice uh, represented here by this Azure Functions. As you can see, we have two uh, methods, right? So each function essentially maps to a sort of sort of one activity. Let me uh, bring the source code here. Uh, with C sharp, like we saw earlier, essentially each function gets its own source file. And um, what you'll see here is I already have some functions in place um, to sort of get us going. I sort of have the pretty standard uh, get and set, right? So this. Um, so some of the cool features, um, what you'll see in Azure Functions here is that uh, um, like ASP.NET Core, um, you can define, you can sort of use a route attribute to, to, to customly define uh, your routes. Um, any uh, 
sort of a token that you put into that route will uh, be accessible as a uh, as a variable. So, so anything you add to the route can then be accessed um, as a parameter of the method. Um, what I was talking to earlier about sort of the bulkiness of uh, using attributes, here's an example of, um, so of course we have, we have the trigger, right? So we define as the first parameter here, right? And so this is the HTTP trigger. And this is what kicks it off in the first place. Um, what we have here is an Azure, a Cosmos DB attribute, which, which actually marks an input. So we are uh, defining uh, Cosmos DB information here, right? So essentially a connection string, which database and which collection. Um, and with the, if you're familiar with Cosmos DB, to do a sort of an ID lookup, you usually need, you need to provide both a partition key and the ID. Um, and so in this case, we, uh, this is exactly what that's doing. Um, while I'm talking about that. Um, also alongside those little tidbit, as long with those other Azure tools, um, the Azure database tools are great as well because you can use all within Visual Studio Code, you can get access to you know, SQL DB, Cosmos DB. Um, so as we can see here, I'm just gonna bring up, I have a list of amplifiers that were already in place. So the next step here is, you know, we have the get and save, and we want to just be able to get a list of all amplifiers by type, right? So we just want to add, take this and add a new function. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to create a function and same type of thing as we saw earlier, do an HTTP trigger, and we're going to call it get amps, get amplifiers by brand. And this is going to be functions. Okay. Okay, so as you can see here, we have this, uh, and we get the same sort of hello world that we saw earlier, right? So um, I am actually going to just sort of delete this with the magic of Snippets, we will go ahead and replace that. Um, so what we're doing, what we're doing here is we're doing a similar type of function to the get uh, amplifier function. Um, in this case, um, again, we still have you know, sort of a custom route. This time we've defined that it starts with the same sort of uh, prefix get amp, and then you know this, and then only when we see the brand without an ID, then we'll. Uh, calls be routed to this Azure function. And so um, as you can see, it's similar to before, we have a, the Cosmos DB input. Um, and in this case, this one's a little different. So instead of getting the ID, we're actually running a query, which in all is prob might look a little foreign. I know it definitely caught me by surprise the first time I started working with this. It was sort of like uh, defining how the data is coming in on an attribute. But if you go back to thinking about sort of, you know, one of the, uh, ideas is around um, Azure Functions is that inputs and triggers could be more flexible, right? So that's why we define them. And again, like I mentioned in, in other languages, um, those definitions are actually even a little clearer because they're defined in JSON files. But um, it's, uh, once you get past that, you can see it, it's, we essentially have a method that we're handed a list of amps uh, based on the, uh, the URL parameter. So the, the body of this uh, of this method is actually uh, pretty uh, <laughs> doesn't do much, right? Because the, uh, the uh, actual constructs of Azure Functions is handling all the heavy lifting for us. Um, now, if you need to do something more advanced, um, Azure Function can can get a lot more powerful, right? So it, it supports the same dependency injection model uh, tooling uh, that you find in ASP.NET Core. Um, and let's say if you really needed to get a, a true Cosmos DB client to, to really do more advanced work than in what you would do is instead of using the output or the inputs uh, and, and declaratively, you would go in and sort of just inject the client and, and sort of manipulate the data in a, in a more traditional manner. So that, that is available as well. So I should, I should mention that. Um, so now that that's in place, uh, I am going to go ahead and we're going to rebuild this. Uh, 
Okay, so I see we're running a little close to time. So I'm going to sort of just switch out of this now and sort of move on over to the portal. So, okay, so, so as you can see, this is, this, so this is actually the, this is the server side instance of what we were just working in. Um, um, as you can see, I've already gone ahead and sort of deployed this previously. Um, so to ensure, you know, see that, you know, what we're, what we're, what we're working on locally is also working on the server, right? So I just wanted to bring everyone to the portal here as well. Um, then once the uh, Azure functions are sort of deployed, you can come in and we can uh, test them locally, um, or to, so excuse me, test them within the portal uh, using the test and run functionality. So here, I'm just gonna type in Fender as a brand and then And as you can see here, we got two fenders in our in our soon to grow and be growing database here. So um, and so that is sort of so that's sort of introduction to Azure Functions, right? So you know it's a very high level sort of just get your feet wet, but hopefully it spurs some interest, gets you um, thinking about maybe how how you can leverage these in your in your own projects. Um, let me just get back to the slide deck now. So we're gonna wrap things up. Um, so we're coming close to the conclusion now, right? So, so let's just, so I just wanna wrap up the scenario that we've been sort of working through, right? So uh, microservices, so let's say now in our company that the AMP microservice took off, it was like, like wildfire. So, um, so now this pattern is being used elsewhere, right? So as we move through, you know, the base team, decided they, they need a microservice, right? And then, and then there's the microphone uh, group, and then there's the guitar group, and then there's the effect group, you know, you know, and then it's just, it gets a bit crazy here. And so, you know, the thing, one of the things you really need to think about when you start dealing with microservices is that, you know, you want to, you, you don't want to run into the situation that you were trying to avoid in the first place, right? So, which is the sort of idea of, you know, Rigid, having too much rigidity and um, and not being able to sort of uh, you know or having it become overwhelming I should say um, when you need to sort of interact with one or more than one of these right so I just wanted to quickly throw a tidbit as far as like um, as a, another product to, to keep an eye out for and um, as we'll just sort of briefly go through this. Um, so uh, you know, in order to sort of con uh, aggregate your endpoint, your different function endpoints, uh, I suggest people look at API Gateway or uh, actually the API, API management tool. Um, I'm gonna bring it up here, I have it in another tab. Um, so what you can see was what I've done ahead of time is I've established this API management service. Now, this is a great feature of uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, it allows you to come in, take, uh, Azure, Azure functions or different, even uh, ASP web API apps, um, you know, logic apps, and sort of build uh, a unified endpoint for all your, and for all your different services, right? So, so ideally, like, so if let's say we got to the point now where we were gonna build our client, right? It says we're gonna build our mobile client to actually access all these different services, you know, and we don't want the client, the client to necessarily have to know perform service discovery, try to figure out where everything is, right? So, so that's where this tool comes in. And so just to really quickly show how the functions that we defined earlier in Azure Functions um, are now also being represented here in the uh, API portal. Um, and they can actually be tested and called as well. So if we're gonna go here and, and use the same function through this service here, as a brand, I'm just gonna do this. Try a different brand this time. All right, and so as you can see, what what's happening here is this is actually acting like a front proxy and handing off the uh, the request to the actual Azure function to do the work. Now, a lot of other features. You know, this is a this is a this is a completely <laughs> another talk for another, hopefully another time. Um, but uh, definitely uh, something that also to keep uh, sort of in the back pocket when you start thinking about um, 
you know, microservices, whether, you know, be Azure functions or um, other solutions such as Kubernetes or, you know, the Docker containers. Um, definitely something to uh, keep in mind. So, so, right, so as we come to the end now, just, just want to reiterate sort of where we came through here, right? So microservices equals choice, right? So, so the, is, again, you know, the, the advantage of these types of patterns are um, choice of uh, persistence, choice of language, right? And being able to sort of use what's best. Now, general, general, you know, warning and just, because just because you can do something, right, it doesn't necessarily mean you should, right? And so, you know, again, you would never suggest that you go out of your way to sort of introduce technologies just for the sake of introducing technologies, right? Again, again, really this, you know, there's still recommending a lot of forethought before moving forward, um, you know, to make those heavy decisions. I mentioned earlier talking about a Python's uh, web service, you know, essentially at the end of the day, it was, you know, the idea was turned down, right? Because at the end of the day, it was, it was so foreign to sort of the standard practice. It was a great experiment. It was a successful experiment, but it just it fell outside the bounds of sort of what the client was comfortable with. So, um, so, you know, lesson learned um, and, you know, great, you know, knowledge for the future. But again, it just, uh, you know, he, he caution when you sort of just uh, move forward with these things. Um, so additional resources. Uh, so by the end of this week, I will have, you know, when this, the deck is uh, ready, what I'll have is a, a lot of sort of the initial resources used to build this presentation. I will also have a GitHub page um, where all the source code is that I showed you today, um, along with probably with some bash scripts or uh, other uh, arm templates to, uh, to get, uh, you know, to get you running, get you, get some samples in your hands and, and, and hopefully uh, get a chance to play. Um, so here's my contact info. Um, you know, it will stick around. I think we have a couple minutes, hopefully, if there's any questions. If not, you know, please, uh, you know, don't hesitate to, you know, to email me or reach out to me on social media. Um, I have both my Twitter and LinkedIn here. Um, happy to discuss this further, um, address any questions. Uh, maybe there's not time for today. Um, at that point, um, I guess we'll just open it up and see if there's any questions. Sir, a couple of questions in the Q&A model. Okay, let me just bring that up. Okay. All right. And which endpoints would this? Okay, so I'm just, okay, all right. Okay, uh, Lucius, let me just get your question here. Um, how to decide which endpoints in your application belong in the same function app, right? And then which endpoints to split up? Uh, also, how do you handle authorization with Azure Functions? Um, uh, let me uh, let me get back to. Uh, thank you, first of all. Thank you for your question. Um, and I want to say, let me get back to you on the authorization one because uh, uh, a couple different models, and uh, I wouldn't want to rush a, a, an explanation to you. Um, as far as sort of determining. Uh, how you which endpoints to use i think it, it comes down well a with with functions the language will be key right so so you'll only be able to use one language per function app right so if you have a, a python function app then you know every function in that app would be python right um it, from there you know you could it, you know there's a couple things you probably more again around the security but you know, back to, you know, to that earlier conversation about sort of ideas of team, right? Functional team, right? And then also, so that bound context is really, you want microservices or services in general are best when they sort of are united enough that, uh, you know, sort of that they're not so strongly coupled to another service that they're that they have to sort of grow exactly alongside of it, that they're self-contained, right? And that's sort of, you know, a lot of the people ask, what's the question, you know, how, how small is small for a microservice, right? Or how big, how big can it be? And really the question is, um, there's sort of this um, 
principle of change as a, as a term, I believe it's, it's from uh, Kent Beck uh, in, his, uh, in, in one of his books. And it talks about, you know, the, uh, the message essentially should be united so that um, it's, un, you know, the code that has to change, you know, code that has to change sort of lives together. Code that, that shouldn't be affected by other change, you know, would be separated out. And then, uh, hopefully that answers your question. If not, then please you know, reach out after this and we can definitely talk some more. Um, uh, so the API uh, gateway. So uh, thanks for this question. Um, so how can you define an API gateway? So yes, yeah, so API uh, gateway is uh, API management. I, I believe I may have missed spoke here, right? So the API management service um, is defined as just sort of just another resource in, in Azure. Um, you know, if we come back to, you know, sort of essentially you would use a, the uh, create resource to go ahead. Um, the reasons why, right? So, so one would be like I mentioned today to, uh, to unify um, or provide a consistent uh, interface. Um, Again, so that model where you know a client app, or let's say a mobile app, right, wouldn't um, would just be concerned with a single endpoint it, for itself to have a single endpoint to talk, uh, you know, to the different microservices, and not and not to be um, tied to sort of the implementation method. There, uh, other reasons are security, right? There are. Um, there are uh, additional security methods you can put on top of API uh, data management. Um, there's also the concept of, of API tracking. Um, if I go back here again, you see up here a link, you can actually create a developer portal. This tool can also be used sort of to actually track calls, right? So you could start using this tool to assign um, particular client codes, if, you know, if you've ever signed up for a third-party API um, and we're given a, a, a particular uh, bearer token or some sort of code that was specific to you, you know, uh, you can use uh, this tool to sort of help uh, provision that and sort of implement that type of service. So uh, I hope that'll answer that question. All right. Anything else? No, if that's the case, then I, I want to thank everyone for your great questions and for your attention today. Um, again, I hope uh, everyone uh, was, was, uh, got something out of it. And I look forward to uh, seeing you and a lot of the other great uh, you know, talks coming up in the, this week. Uh, uh, I highly suggest if you have time now, uh, you know, uh, my colleague Darius is starting in a couple of minutes and, you know, he, I know he has a great presentation about the comparison of Azure uh, to AWS and sort of, uh, and, and uh, hopefully that maybe even Azure Functions versus AWS Lambda might be in there. I don't know, but uh, I'll be there to, to sort of stick around and see and uh, I encourage everyone to, you know, to, to sort of leverage this uh, opportunity. Um, to uh, see more talks. And uh, I look forward to sort of chatting, conversing with everyone. And uh, on that note, uh, thanks again for your attendance and have a great day.